Welcome in everyone, Lufo ELT, coming to you with a new series on my channel, and this is a business English series. So this um, series of videos is going to be uh, put in a playlist, and this is uh, targeted for more intermediate to advanced uh, English language learners who are using business in a professional environment for work. Um, and uh, in particular, in this series, um, I'm going to be focusing on management positions. Um, so we'll be talking about some concepts related to management. But really, I think that this will be helpful for um, anyone who is working in um, uh, English uh, language environment, not only managers. And even if you are a native speaker, I think you possibly could learn a few um, things from this series. Um, so uh, today's video is going to be on uncertainty and relationships. But since this is a new um, series, I'm just going to explain uh, basically how each video is structured. So there will be about four parts. And the first part is for introducing new vocabulary. And uh, the second part, uh, I will be introducing a few, um, maybe between two and four pretty general project management concepts, or just in general management concepts. Um, and then uh, after explaining these concepts, um, I'll give a comprehension quiz, which is more focused on uh, ensuring that you understand the concepts and not so much the language. So this is a language learning channel and this is a language learning video. But for this business English series, because it is focused on business, we're going to be focusing more on the content, the business side of the video and letting that drive the language learning. All right. And then at the end, we'll just quickly wrap up the video. All right, so let's just get right into it. Um, as I said, the first part is for uh, learning language. And the goal here is just to introduce some of the key vocabulary that will be used in this series. All right, so uh, here we have five words on the screen. I've given you the word, the part of speech, and a simple definition. There's no example sentence because we're going to be looking at some of these words being used in uh, context right after we look at these vocabulary words. Okay, so the first word is dynamic, dynamic, and that means uh, the way that two or more people behave with each other because of a particular situation. So it's kind of like another word for relationship, sort of. Um, and the next word is mutual, mutual, and this means um, something that is shared between two or more people or even two or more groups. Okay, um, and the next word is paradoxical, paradoxical, and uh, this word means something like a, some kind of situation uh, that is made up of two opposite things that seem like they should be impossible. They seem like they should cancel each other out, but is actually true or possible. And this word paradoxical is an adjective and it comes from the noun paradox. All right. And a paradox is again, just descri describing this situation where there's two things that seem like they shouldn't be able to exist at the same time. Okay. Um, it, and again, some of these words might sound difficult or confusing, but don't worry, you're going to be able to understand as I uh, explain them and use them in context. So don't worry. All right, the next word is prioritize. Prioritize. And this means to organize things so that the most important thing is done first. All right, so sometimes we prioritize things um, by... Uh, urgency, like which ones are the most important. Sometimes we prioritize things by uh, size, how quickly we can get them done, or there are many different ways to organize which things uh, you want to do first. Okay, 
Uh, the next word is constraint. Constraint. And that means uh, something that uh, limits or restricts someone or something. Something that uh, makes it more difficult or limits uh, what you're trying to achieve. All right. And uh, five more words here. Resolve. Resolve it means to find an answer or solution to something or to settle or solve an issue or a problem. All right, and the next word, conflict. A conflict is some sort of difference that prevents agreement, or di it's a disagreement between ideas or feelings or people. Um, so basically, it's like a disagreement that must be resolved in order to proceed. And the next word is motivate. Motivate means to give someone a reason to do something. So when we're at work, we have things that we need other people to do for us. And if we motivate them, they will do those things better or to the best of their ability. But if we don't motivate them, maybe they'll be uh, you know, less um, enthusiastic about doing what we ask them. Maybe they won't put as much energy into it. Maybe they'll do it slowly. So motivate means uh, finding a way, a reason to make someone do something to the best of their ability. Um, autonomously. The next word is autonomously. And what that means is having the power or right to govern one's self. Uh, so basically, uh, the ability to act on your own. So usually when you want to make a big decision, you have to maybe ask your boss about it. And in that case, you're not acting autonomously. Uh, when you make smaller decisions, you do not have to ask your boss about it. And in that case, you are acting autonomously. All right, and the last word is proactively. Um, and proactively means that you're working in a way where you're trying to control a situation by uh, making things happen first or by preparing for possible future problems. Um, so it means that uh, you try to do things um, in anticipation of something happening. So, um, you know, for example, uh, if you know it's going to rain, you're going to bring an umbrella or wear a raincoat. That is being proactive about the weather. So this word comes from the adjective proactive, and there's an antonym for this word, an opposite meaning word, which means reactive, which means that uh, something happens and then you do something. Proactive means you do something first before that thing happens. So like I said, I gave the example about being proactive about the rain. If you're being reactive, you would go outside get wet from the rain and then go buy an umbrella that's being reactive okay all right so uh hopefully you understand all of the vocabulary and now i want to use some of that vocabulary in context so uh, what makes a good effective manager well in my opinion a good effective manager understands different types of uncertainty. There are different types of uncertainty and if you're not sure what those different types are, don't worry, that's what we're, one of the things we're going to learn today. All right, and a good effective manager also understands the individual and group dynamic. Okay, so this underlying word that you see here is one of the vocabulary words that we just went over. So whenever you see a word that's in bold and underlined on the screen, this is one of the vocabulary words. So again, a good effective manager understands the individual group dynamic and their role as a manager in that dynamic. All right. So if you want to better understand the words that we learned, you can rewind and look at the definition and then come back and look at this. You can do that as many times as you like or need. Okay, so what else makes a good manager? A good effective manager has strong relationships 
which are built over time and centered around mutual trust with the people that they're working with. All right. Uh, also, a good effective manager balances competing interests and effectively makes paradoxical decisions. So these are decisions where it feels like you might be in a situation where someone or something uh, loses or like so someone has to lose or something has to be sacrificed or lost that's a paradoxical decision and uh, good effective managers are very capable they understand how to make those decisions all right uh, and that is something we're going to be looking at in this series all right and um, a good effective manager understands how to prioritize constraint factors all right uh, there are three main constraint factors that we'll look at in this series and uh, a good effective manager has to uh, prioritize them when making very important decisions. All right. And a good effective manager also knows how to effectively resolve conflicts. Okay. Conflicts happen between people. They happen between ideas. They happen between circumstances. And a good effective manager has a plan for how to resolve these conflicts. And that is something that we're going to look at as well in this series. And finally, uh, uh, actually not finally, sorry. Uh, there's two more to go. <laughs> uh, a good effective manager motivates uh, the people they are responsible for and gets them to do important tasks as autonomously and proactively as possible. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that a manager asks the, the people that are working for them uh, to do things and gets them motivated to do those things and teaches the workers how to do this independently on their own and before things happen. So uh, these workers are able to do things independently and they're also able to kind of anticipate what will happen in the near future and uh, be proactive about their work rather than reactive, all right? That is what a good effective manager is able to get out of their workers. Okay, and lastly, I would say that a good effective manager creates new leaders. All right. That, in my opinion, is the sign of a very good leader. Uh, a very good leader doesn't just get their people to follow them, but a very good leader creates new leaders. All right. So let's move on now to part two. And we're going to be looking at some of these general project management concepts. Today, we're going to look at two of the things that I just explained to you that make uh, a good, effective manager. And that was the first two things. A uh, good effective manager understands the different types of uncertainty and a good effective manager understands the individual group dynamic and their role as a manager in that dynamic. All right. So we'll be looking at uncertainty and relationships and we'll be looking at a couple of different models. Um, one is called the uncertainty matrix and the other one is called the triangle of relationships all right and the goal here is to introduce you to ideas that uh, should help you to manage uncertainty and organize your relationships with people all right so let's take a look at this okay here what you see are the four different types of uncertainty in the uncertainty matrix all right um on the uh vertical axis this is measuring uh the level of uncertainty, okay? So we go from low uncertainty down at the bottom to high uncertainty up at the top, okay? And uh, on the horizontal axis, here we're measuring complexity, all right? So how complex are uh, the tasks or the project or the product being made or the team or the situation, how complex is it? So um, on the right side, we have low complexity. That means it's not very complicated. And on the left side, we have high complexity. That means it is 
more complicated. Okay, so let's take a look at the four different types of uncertainty and understand them. I'll just run through them very quickly. So the most difficult type of uncertainty is chaos, total chaos. And that means that there are unknowable levels of complexity and uncertainty. They're so high, we don't even fully understand them. And the next step forward is not clear in this situation, okay? Um, the next type of uh, level of, of uncertainty uh, is unforeseen uncertainty, okay? And this means that uh, it's something that we didn't know that we didn't know, okay? So it means that we didn't know it and we couldn't expect that it was going to happen. So this is medium to high level of complexity and uncertainty. You didn't expect this, but you have an idea of how to proceed, okay? Now, um, uh, the next uh, type of uh, uncertainty is foreseen uncertainty. So here we have what we call known unknowns, all right? And this is lower levels of complexity and uncertainty. Um, and also can include higher levels of uncertainty complexity. It depends on the situation. But um, basically, it means that you expected something to happen, but you didn't know exactly when and maybe uh, or how or who or something like that so you you can anticipate that there will be something but you just don't fully understand it so you can expect it and basically you know how to proceed all right and the last type of uncertainty here is variation and this is uh, low complexity and low uncertainty and uh, basically this is a deviation from your plan or your expectation of what's going to happen. So it just means that uh, you didn't plan this way, but it's not a major problem, usually. All right, so um, when we think about different types of uncertainty on a project basis, usually we start off with chaos or unforeseen uncertainty. So we have maybe no idea what our budget is or you know things like this. Um, and basically, each day we go to work and each task that we perform or assign to someone else, we're, of course, we're doing work in order to try to uh, achieve making the actual product or the deliverable, whatever it is. But we should also be making progress towards uh, limiting and reducing these types of uncertainties. We want to move towards certainty, right? So progress means we're moving from chaos towards variation. Um, and it's important to note that it doesn't always move in one direction. You may be working for a few weeks with your team and then something unforeseen happens. And so you are sort of pulled back towards, you know, more uncertainty or more complexity. But you know, as you learn these uh, project management techniques, you will be able to learn how to overcome that, okay? And so each decision you make uh, at each stage or with each task should be progressive. It should be towards moving from chaos towards variation, um, as well as, you know, completing the project and producing the deliverable, all right, whatever the goal is, okay? so. Uh, that is basically the four different types of uncertainty. And now we're moving on to the triangle of relationships. Okay, so the triangle of relationships is basically a useful model for assessing people that are related to your project or your company or your team, whoever you're responsible for. Okay, and there exists a relationship between um, all three sides of the triangle. Okay, and that's what I'm going to explain here. So, you have uh, the manager to um, individual relationship, and that's uh, managerial authority. It must be balanced with uh, individual autonomy of your workers. Okay, this influences how the team is structured and how it functions. 
okay? So you have the manager to individual dynamic, all right? And then um, on the other side of that, you have the manager to team dynamic. And so this is basically where someone is in a formal position, usually of authority, but not always in authority, uh, who draws the team together and manages their uh, actions and their efforts and their tasks and their work, right? They move the group um, in order to achieve creating the deliverable, okay? That is the manager to team dynamic. And uh, down at the bottom, you'll see that the team is comprised of individuals, okay? And individuals need to understand how to uh, be motivated and how to be contributing member of the team. So this is the individual to team dynamic, all right? Um, so you can start to see here that these relationships are very important, that these dynamics are very important, and that sometimes there may be a conflict between some of them, right? Uh, sometimes an individual of the uh, member of the team disagrees with the rest of the team, or the one of the individuals is disagrees there's a conflict with the manager or something like this so we have these kind of paradoxical situations that arise and that we need to overcome and we'll look more specifically at how to manage that in another video but first let's try to understand a little bit more deeply uh, about relationships so you have to consider as a manager what effect your actions will have on these other perspectives, the individual perspective or the team perspective, okay? And one thing that's very common uh, is that less effective managers tend to focus more on the team or the group interest um, or the interest of the project or the deliverable very, very strongly. And they basically they end up forgetting about the existence of the individual. They start treating people like just cogs in a machine or, you know, not as individuals, right? Just as pieces of a machine. But the sum of all these relationships is very important. So none of them can be ignored individual to manager, manager to team, and team to individual. These are all parts of a whole and they're all important. And as I said, there are paradoxes that arise with them. But if we want individuals to strongly contribute to the team, be strong members of the team or the project, then they have to clearly understand how their personal involvement contributes to the team or the project. And we also have to find out what motivates them as individuals as well. Uh, managers can facilitate this if they develop close relationships with team members as individuals by learning what is important to them and helping them carve out a team role that serves both their personal ambitions and the team objectives, okay? So we have to consider how to balance these paradoxes that arise in our management styles. So let's take a look at some of these paradoxes. So let's say you're working on a project and um, you know the project is going relatively well, but there's something that's happening. Maybe it's the result of someone's work or how they're doing something that you're not totally satisfied with. So you have to make a decision here, okay? Are you going to focus on completing the tasks that are involved in creating the deliverable product? Or are you going to uh, take a moment or some time or take this opportunity for teaching the individual or the team about how to improve whatever it is that you see that they're not doing exactly the way you think it should be done. So this is task completion versus opportunities for learning and development. Um, and again, this can be on an individual basis or a team basis. So you have to consider that as a manager. Uh, which one are you going to prioritize? Task completion or learning and development opportunities? It depends on the circumstances. 
and we will look at how to make uh, effective decisions about these paradoxes later on when we consider the constraint factors. But first, we just have to understand how these affect relationships. All right, and the second uh, paradoxical decision that we have to consider is support versus confrontation, all right? Uh, so we have to balance um, this paradox and understand when we should do support and confrontation. When do we foster and practice mutual support, um, but at the same time, confront and challenge individual members of your team? All right, this encouraged confrontation is sometimes called creative abrasions because it produces good ideas, innovative thinking, and challenges to things that people kind of assume to be true. So basically, uh, when are you going to support and encourage your team? And when are you going to challenge your team to do better? If you constantly challenge your team, and say, no, it's not good enough, you have to do it this way, or I want this, or I want that, then they're going to start to feel like it's impossible to satisfy you as a manager. So, you also do have to hit them with support. At the same time, if you give too much support, they'll think that you're always going to be satisfied with whatever it is that they do, and so they won't be as motivated to try hard. So, you have to find the right times to support your team, and the right times to challenge your team and confront them. You should make strategic decisions about when to do that. And as you get to know the individual members on your team and understand these dynamics better, you will be able to more effectively know when to support them and when to confront them. All right, and then the last uh, paradox that we're just gonna talk about today is uh, managerial authority versus individual autonomy. So uh, basically, teams need structure, direction, and leadership, of course. So that's where you come in as a manager. But uh, managerial authority uh, can sometimes uh, lead to people, individual members of a team or a whole group feeling like they don't have any uh, ability to make a decision. So you have to balance your authority and your uh, directions and you telling people what to do with uh, individual team members, allowing them to have a voice um, in the decisions that are, um, are made, which affect the group as a whole and the project and everything. Uh, and you also have to let the individual members of your team exercise discretion and uh, so that they feel that they have autonomy. Because if they feel like they have to constantly follow whatever it is that you say, they'll be less likely to think of solutions to problems or be able to think proactively because they're just waiting to be told what to do, right? Uh, that's not what we want as managers. We want our individuals being proactive, coming up with creative ideas, and using their own discretion about how to solve different types of problems. Okay, so that is, uh, I hope, helpful in understanding how um, we like recognize these uh, relationship dynamics and um, how we can um, balance um, these paradoxical situations that come up. So as a manager, you should help um, an individual carve out very specific tasks and roles that serve their personal ambitions and uh, the group uh, objectives, as I mentioned. So that means you have to find out what motivates individual members of your team. Um, of course, money is always a huge one. Um, status, maybe they want, they're looking for a promotion or something like this, um, but Usually there's something deeper. Uh, some people maybe care very deeply about their family or some people are like to challenge themselves and they want to learn. So um, in that case, uh, maybe you can uh, support uh, that ambition and help someone maybe take an online course or something like that. You work better with people who you're friends with. So if you find out what motivates people and you support that 
and uh, you shape their work in a way that is friendly towards their personal ambitions, then those people are going to like working for you, and this triangle of relationship is going to be completed. All right. So you also have to make um, interdependencies between different tasks clear. Usually when you're working with a team, each person is kind of specializing in one area or another. So maybe there's like a sales member, uh, a marketing member, um, you know, research and development, uh, these, all these different um, tasks that need to be completed. And sometimes we can get too focused on our own tasks and not really um, understand how it affects other people's work. So making the whole picture clear to um, the collective unit is very, very effective in getting uh, the individual to team dynamic to function strongly. All right. So um, managers can facilitate these things that I've just talked about by developing close relationships with individuals who will then become strongly contributing members to the team. And you can do this by, again, learning what's important to them, making your communication predictable and uh, encouraging them to communicate with you as well uh, through clear channels. So, you know, it, it's confusing if sometimes uh, you call them on the phone and sometimes you send an email, sometimes you stop by their desk. Uh, the channels for communication should be clear the time for communication should be clear and it should be predictable and understood and encouraged. Uh, when people feel like they can, they can talk, they can speak what's on their mind, uh, this relationship triangle will be strengthened immensely. All right. Also providing clear guidelines and examples. Um, a lot of times managers will say, I want this done, but they don't give the workers any tools to do it. And they don't provide any really super clear examples of what it is that they're talking about. You don't just give a vague description of what you want. You need to uh, make sure that the final goal of whatever it is you have in mind is crystal clear to your workers. And you also need to give them effective tools. If they have the tools and they understand what you want done, they're far more likely to work more effectively. All right, and um, having an inform informal nature to your relationship with your subordinates is also very, very important. Um, like I said, you work better with your friends. So don't just talk to them only about work. Even though your subordinates and you uh, and this whole uh, triangle of relationships is centered around work, uh, you also need to show that you care about them as human beings. At the end of the day, we are all human beings and uh, you need to acknowledge that by having an informal nature to your relationship. doesn't mean you have to be best friends or know every detail about their life, but maybe you could talk about, you know, whatever you did on the weekend or whatever it is. All right. Um, and finally, building trust. And that is a topic for another video. But that's a very important one. So make sure you tune in next time for the video on building trust. Um, that's also extremely important to strengthening the triangle of relationships. All right. So let's summarize here. Um, you need to recognize different types of uncertainty by using the uncertainty matrix. We talked about chaos, unforeseen uncertainty, foreseen uncertainty, and variation. You also need to um, recognize the interpersonal dynamics of the triangle of relationships. So you have manager to individual, individual to team, and manager to team. All right. Um, and finally, you have to consider how to balance task completion versus learning and development, support versus confrontation, and managerial authority versus individual autonomy. All right, so now let's get into part three, which is the comprehension quiz. And the goal here is just to un uh, ensure that you understood the ideas that we just looked at. So basically what I'll be doing is giving you a scenario and then asking you a multiple choice question. Okay, so let's take a look. This first question is about comprehending, comprehending the different types of uncertainty. So the first scenario, let's say, uh, by the way, all of these scenarios are uh, 
um, about a publishing company because that is my background. So, but you can kind of imagine, you know, whatever uh, uh, industry or field that you're working in and try to understand it through that lens if it's more helpful. But without further ado, let's get into it. So the first scenario, you're planning a project schedule, okay? And you know it's possible, even likely, that at some point during the project, the designer assigned to your project will take a vacation. Um, but you're not sure exactly when, and you, so you decide to include an extra five days into the project design schedule to account for this possibility. So the question is, what type of uncertainty is being described and dealt with in this scenario? Is it chaos, unforeseen uncertainty, foreseen uncertainty, or variation? All right, you take a minute, read the question, think about it, and I'll tell you the answer in just a moment. All right, the answer is foreseen uncertainty. So we know something is going to happen and uh, we are going to try to account for that. All right, and scenario two, this is about comprehending relationships. So you're explaining to your outsourced content editor that they will be working with the writer and that after the content edits are made, the manuscripts will be designed. So the writer and the editor are working together and then when they're finished, you're going to send everything to the design team. So the question here is what relationship dynamic are you as the manager trying to get the editor to understand? Is it manager to individual, individual to team, or manager to team? Take a moment, read the question, think about it. You can pause the video if you like, and I will show the answer now. Individual to team, that's right. So here you're explaining something to your content editor and you're letting them know how their work is contributing to the team. All right, once they understand that, they'll be able to have uh, that in mind and contribute to the team more effectively. Okay, and this is also about comprehending relationships. Scenario three, so far the project is on schedule and most things are going well. However, you're not satisfied with a particular type of edit your new content editor has been making. So what type of paradoxical decision are you facing here? Is it one, task completion versus learning and development, two, support versus confrontation, or three, managerial authority versus individual autonomy. All right, and I'll show you the answer now. All right, basically you have to decide whether to allow uh, for just completing the task or to um, tell the editor how you want them to do this particular type of edit. Um, I also think that three could be a possible answer here um, because you're deciding whether to use your authority to tell the editor what to do or to allow them to do it their own way, okay? Um, so, but I think one is probably the more correct answer here. All right, and um, now we're looking at comprehending types of uncertainty. So here, scenario four. A member of the digital team contacts you and says that they forgot to send the digital content to the outsourced developer. This causes a two week delay in your project. What type of uncertainty is being described in this scenario? Is it chaos, unforeseen, foreseen, or variation? All right, what do you think? You can pause the video now if you want to think about it and I will show you the answer now unforeseen uncertainty. All right, this is something that you could not have predicted or planned for, but it happens. So that's why it's unforeseen uncertainty. Um, and how to deal with this is something that we're going to go over in a future video um, about 
dealing with constraint factors. Okay. Um, now, comprehending types of uncertainty, another scenario. Let's say that you've been uh, assigned to develop a new project, a new reading series. Uh, you have not been provided any useful information by the company about the reason for this product or why it's been requested. You've not been told any information about who the target customers are uh, or given any business case for this request. You've been given a budget, but a few weeks later, it's reduced by 50%. And a few weeks after that, your team leader quits the company. All right, so what type of uncertainty is being described in this scenario? Is it chaos, unforeseen, foreseen, or variation? Uh, you can probably guess the answer is chaos, right? Uh, this is a situation in which the circumstances continue to change uh, in very big ways that are totally unpredictable. So you really have no idea. Uh, again, we're going to talk about how to deal with this in a future video, but a lot of times you have to adapt to the new circumstances. It's very, very frustrating and stressful, but there's nothing else that can be done. Um, Sometimes new opportunities that benefit you open up in chaotic situations, and we will talk about that as well. But for now, let's just move on. All right, we're talking again about different types of uncertainty. So here's another scenario. The designer said she would finish editing a file by Friday, but on Friday afternoon, she contacts you and tells you she needs more time. She promises to send it Monday morning. So... What type of uncertainty is being described in this scenario? Chaos, unforeseen, foreseen, or variation. She's supposed to send it to you on Friday afternoon, but she says Monday morning. What do you think? Yeah, that's right. Variation, okay? It's not a big deal whether she sent it to you by Friday afternoon or Monday morning. Usually not a big deal, okay? All right, another question about types of uncertainty. Uh, you're working on an urgent and important project. You've been negotiating with a couple of writers, outsourced writers, for about 10 days. You've shown sample units, explained the work, explained all the details, and reached agreements on how much work they want to do, the delivery schedule, and the terms of payment. And just as you send the contract and work to them, suddenly both of the writers pull out of the project and you're left with no writers. Okay, so what type of uncertainty is being described here? Is it chaos, unforeseen, foreseen, or variation? All right, you can pause the video if you want to think about it and I'll show you the answer now. Unforeseen, right? We didn't predict that this would happen and... Um, you know, it does cause a delay, uh, but what needs to be done is very clear, right? We just need to find new writers, all right? So this is unforeseen uncertainty, and luckily we know what to do. All right, so uh, that wraps up this video, and I hope that uh, this video is very helpful for you to understand um, different types of uncertainty as well as relationships and the nature of some of those paradoxical decisions that we discussed and uh, in the next video we're going to be talking a lot more about um, uh, how to establish and build trust uh, in those uh, relationships balancing competing interests uh, to make effective paradoxical decisions and also how to understand and prioritize constraint factors. All right, so I hope you'll tune in for the next video. I hope this video was very helpful. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, or suggestions, please feel free to comment on the video and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. Have a great day.